right? Um, and yeah, lastly, I just want to say um, thank you again for, for joining us with um, this presentation today. Um, Tucson Audubon's mission is to um, inspire people to enjoy and protect birds. And um, I really think this presentation is going to contribute to that. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce Simon Tolzman. Um, I'll let uh, him introduce himself and we'll get started here. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the intro and thanks for having me here. Um, I will get right into it. Okay, can uh can you see the screen share? Okay, cool, awesome. So yeah, this is um this is a brand new presentation that I have been that's been in the works for a little while now, and I think it's it's one of my best. So this is my um artistic um expedition into wildlife photography. Hello. Yeah, so I've been uh, doing photography in general and just kind of outdoorsy stuff for my entire life. Um, I We've always had cameras lying around the house and it's always been something fun I've done. Um, as far as as far as my interests go, I now live in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, attending school at Colorado State University. Um, I'm currently studying conservation biology. Um, I'm pretty, I'm a pretty avid rock climber and mountain biker on top of being, um, a very big nature person. Um, any adventure that I can possibly get my feet going on, I, there's a, you can, you can bet that I will be out. Um, yeah. And, um, I, the gear that I currently use, uh, camera wise is the Nikon Z9, with this whole slew of lenses. Um, some of the photos that you'll see throughout this um, include some with previous gear. Um, and yeah, just kind of going, going a little back in time. I really started my wildlife photography journey um, in 2016 when I got my first kind of like real camera for birding. I really just used it to take um, like document shots of birds just to prove I'd seen something. I started to get a little more serious with um, composition and stuff like that in 2019 and into 2020. During COVID, my camera broke and I had to resort to just taking photos with my phone through my binoculars, which wasn't the most fun. But then I got I, in 2021, I bought a Nikon Coolpix P1000 and really started to think about um like how how to take much better photos, which resulted in uh, me kind of jumping straight into the deep end and going right and just going completely all in. Um, so yeah, through this presentation, I'll cover a pretty wide range of topics, um, starting with field technique, going into creative compositions, exposing creatively, the challenges and rewards of wildlife photography, and also how wildlife photography can be used um, as an outlet for conservation advocacy. Um, as far as field technique goes, it's really all about, it's really all in the angles and how you use them. Um, as far as far as as I'm concerned, I've I've heard from a lot of people, and it is true that. Um, it's it's always good to be at eye level. You should always be at eye level with with your subjects. And I think that I think that that's a good rule of thumb for some situations. But I think that um, a lot of the time you can really you can really make a creative image out of being completely unconventional and doing things that no one else would really do. Um, for example, um, there are a lot of cases in which getting eye level can help you. Um, get a much better image than not. So as you can see on the left, um, the photos, the photos in focus, it's sharp. Um, even though it is a quite flat image, there isn't much interesting to it. Because I wasn't at eye level, there's very little like depth to the image and there's quite a bit of distraction. And then with the exact same birds, just a couple days later, um, you can see on the right, um, there's a much, there's a much shallower depth of field. Um, as I got eye level and there's very few distractions. 
um going into some more creative creative angles and stuff like that um i had morning doves that nested on my back porch for a couple of years in a row and i found that it was a very cool way to get some really creative photos that are at very unconventional angles you never really see these details of of a morning dove or of many birds at all um if you weren't thinking outside of the box in that kind of way there we go and yeah and of course exceptions can be made um to like how how you want to work angles i think that it's completely situational and should be based on um what you think is right for the situation um really analyzing the available light to create um a sense of atmosphere in a photo can be a really good way of conveying um emotion and how and, and really getting your message across in your photos so as you can see on the left, um, I was I was standing uh, up through the sunroof of of my of my car, photographing these pronghorn antelope running through the prairie. And after after they were um, they were running through the prairie quite backlit, it created a very it created a very moody um, kind of. I, I think that the the atmosphere is is a little more up for interpretation in in the left photo and then as soon as they crossed the road and stood up on the hill it really it really creates a completely different atmosphere so really really just using light to your advantage even in the same same exact situations can be a really good way to go about that um same thing with using the surroundings and your subject's environment um that can be a really good way of of creating atmosphere as you can see with the left, the oven bird was sitting high up on like a fence that was blocking off uh, part of a building. And the really, the really uh, like the grid like texture of the bricks and the fence that it was sitting on creates for a pretty cool image. Same thing with the rippling water and the, the jagged ice of the American Dipper below. Um, it's really it's really interesting to be able to use the environment of of your subject to create interesting texture and a lot of atmosphere um a lot of the time you'll be dealing with environmental challenges when you're when you're photographing any wildlife i mean with the in this particular case you're you're dealing with eminent thunderstorms and you're dealing with the fact that you're at fourteen thousand feet above sea level so you're dealing with um lack of oxygen and all and and thinner atmosphere which actually sometimes can mean that you'll get sharper sharper images there's there's less um like there's physically less gas that your camera has to like work through to uh be able to take photos um and yeah i think um it's like 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 i've been saying it's completely situationally based you can use you can use your foreground to create texture you can use foreground and background in tandem to create interesting texture and i think that um sometimes sometimes what you had in mind just doesn't end up working out and um that's just i guess part of the game um going back into some some lighting issues with when you're photographing wildlife um really really utilizing your position um like in comparison to where your light source is is a really good way of creating atmosphere in your photos so i've kind of drawn it out a little here um this is the same bird that went between two adjacent trees one of which um had light diffused through the spruce on the left so there was sunlight that was kind of poking through the foggy morning um, and really illuminating the face a lot differently than the photo on the right, where it was the very early morning sunlight that was casting almost a, a magenta glow on on the bird. It's very evenly lit on the bird and quite dark in the background where the tree was casting shadows. So utilizing where you are, where you're standing and photographing your subject in comparison to your subject is always is always something really good to keep in mind. Um, as as far as as far as these go, it's all just kind of about um 
utilizing utilizing your angles getting low um holding your camera and i guess some sometimes it's good to get out of your comfort zone i've definitely held my camera over some bodies of water that i would be quite unfortunate if i dropped my camera into um and yeah just kind of making making sure that you're making making the best of each and every individual situation and trying trying to capture the the atmosphere the environment the the subject itself as best as you can um going into eye level shooting i think um a little bit of a misconception that i've seen sometimes is that it means that you have to be laying on the ground or in the mud or getting getting really dirty um it's really all about your position to where the where your subject's eye is so if your subject is at eye level in a tree obviously you don't have to get um down on the ground or you don't have to lay in the mud or anything like that to get an eye level photo um and then sometimes i think that i think the um the fact that the fact of the matter is that sometimes you do actually just have to lay down get dirty get in the mud um if you want like intricate interesting shots um and then like i've been saying it's completely situational sometimes photographing something that's above eye level if there's um if there's a lot going on in the foreground mid ground and background like you can see with the fox squirrel on the left there's a lot of berries there's a lot of color it was just above eye level um and it works it works out it works out for this particular scenario in the exact same tree there was uh there was this robin that was feeding a little closer to eye level but still just above and it really and it really does convey the same image it would be a lot different and there would be less texture to the image if i were way above or way below the robin some other miscellaneous field techniques that i've picked up on over the years um and i'm sure that this one is pretty obvious is having having patience when it comes to um wildlife photography i for one have um really had to learn patience when it comes to this and it a lot of a lot of the shots that that you that you dream of getting don't just kind of happen on your first on your first try um with this with this i mean a lot of a lot of wildlife photography is just kind of lying in wait. You you utilize your knowledge of what a bird does, how it acts, how it behaves, um, to predict where it might be, where where you might be able to have your best opportunity at photographing it. As um, and yeah, so I think just kind of making sure that you I think that, I mean, like I said, this was something that I really had to had to work and I've had to work up to. Um is just being patient and remembering that it doesn't it doesn't just happen in in two seconds most most of the time at least um and yeah so understanding behavioral patterns of of wildlife is is really really helpful when it comes to um when it comes to photographing them so for example this this northern cardinal that was sitting on the fence of my neighbor's house back home um I knew I knew that it it was I think it was nine o'clock at night and the only light was a street light in the alley. Um, so I knew that I had to be shooting at really slow shutter speeds um, to be able to um, capture enough light to to get an image like this. And as you can see with these, the bird, the bird sharpen and focus cardinals. I, I'm not I'm not sure if um, many of you are familiar, but they are extremely Liddy. they really do not like to sit still and when they are sitting still um it's for an extremely short period of time so understanding that in these um kind of like adverse lighting conditions where you're shooting at one fifteenth of a second um can really and as you can see here it didn't it didn't really work out this is this is in my opinion a very creative photo um it kind of I it's it's very abstract and it isn't conventional um but understanding that I could get two different like um artistic photos out of this one out of this one experience was was pretty cool to know um and same same thing same thing with this understanding not just behavioral patterns but also understanding the uh 
the environment like really knowing what what's going on around your subject can be a really good way of um taking creative photos for example this gull at sunset was sitting on this beach and there were waves that, that were actively crashing i knew that if i wanted to get a crashing wave in the background i needed to be at a certain position and make sure that i was shooting at a fast enough frame rate to actually capture the the wave crashing um and yeah um with with this kind of a thing you have you have a lot of birds that are that behave in a way that um uh that are you wouldn't exactly i guess i guess it's it's more so that you you do have a lot of wildlife that behave in very specific ways that um you kind of have to really prepare for so a lot of shorebirds um like the solitary sandpiper for example um they really like to just walk around on kind of like floating mats of grass and small ephemeral ponds in the springtime so knowing knowing that you have to lay down at the edge of water might be something good to prepare for ahead of time. And that's that's all because of your preparation for really understanding how these birds act, how they how they behave and stuff like that. Same thing with same thing with a lot of other passerines, some some birds like flycatchers. They will go back to the same perches over and over and over. They'll fly from one stick and they'll go out, they'll catch a bug, they'll come back to the exact same stick. So if you can, if you can see over, over the course of a, whatever period of time, um, that there's a bird that likes to hang out in one specific area, you can plan a shoot with that, with that individual bird at that exact spot, um, a little better than say, you're just walking around and you, you see something completely by chance. Um, and yeah, just kind of like understanding that there are going to be a lot of surprises when you're when you're out photographing wildlife. With with this particular instance, I was actually out walking along this really muddy creek looking for mussels and clams and stuff like that. Um, and I ended up seeing these two golden back snipe flies that were stuck kind of floating in the middle of the river. Um, and, and these are I mean, these are these are gorgeous insects. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was definitely a surprise. I'd never seen one before. I'd never seen him before. Um, and yeah, I think, I think just kind of understanding that there are going to be, or just kind of knowing and kind of expecting surprises is always something good to keep on your radar. Even when you're out looking for one thing in particular, there's probably going to be something else that pops in that, um, is going to be a very interesting opportunity. Moving on from field technique, um, going into creative composition and exposure, I kind of talked quite a bit about that in the in the field technique segment, but this just goes a little a little farther into it. Um, for example, shooting shooting when the light is when it, using sunlight, if when the light is low, a lot of the time you're gonna get more evenly lit. Uh, photos then middle of the day uh, or even or they'll, they'll look a lot nicer in my opinion than on cloudy days um, shooting at sunrise or sunset can give you a lot of really interesting opportunities to get really interesting photos for example I was I was following this black-throated blue orbler past the sunset I got a couple of cool photos of it with the the really orange kind of salmony glow um, directly behind it. But then I realized that there was a tree, there was a line of trees that was separating the sunset from the from the far um, east horizon. And I knew that the clouds were pretty cool gray. So if I if I followed the bird and I knew that at some point in time, it was going to get to a point where uh, I'd be able to get the cool and the warm light in the same image, I knew that that would be pretty cool. Same thing with like the rim lighting around the leaves of the tree of the i think it's a hawthorn um and there's a there's a lot there's it's very moody photo there's a lot to it that's going on and i think that one of my favorite things um like grow like living in an urban environment is utilizing multiple different uh like temperatures of light um that can be done with street lights and like incandescent lights in the same if you're shooting in an urban environment or like i said sunset and the space away from sunset if it's available 
um this was an example of of a red winged blackbird that i was photographing at a marsh i was getting some very cool very warm uh photos backlit by the sun and i realized that if i if i literally turned around at 180 degrees there was another red winged blackbird that was sitting behind me with the road in the background and when cars would drive by i could get some very interesting photos of the birds sitting on the cattails with uh with the headlights in the background i think what a lot of people are really liking to see now is um very large prominent bokeh in their in their photos so using using cars, using streetlights, using um, stoplights and stuff like that, if you're if you're near um, urban environments, can always, in in my opinion, is a is a really good way to elevate your photos and get get that bokeh that a lot of people really like to see. Um, same same thing with this. I I really grew once I um, began really thinking about becoming more of a wildlife photographer was shooting with like strictly in urban environments i i was very fortunate to um have been born and raised in the middle of chicago illinois so there's quite a lot of urban sprawl to be able to photograph things in and there's a lot of birds that have adapted to live in the city so for example the black crown night heron which is i believe it is a federally listed species they're they're making a great comeback but they are still they are still federally protected um they spend a lot of their time in these really trashy areas because there's a lot of available food um so kind of incorporating all of the trash and the rusty metal into this into this photo on the left was something that i really wanted to go for and then um, i was walking around downtown chicago one day with my camera and i saw this pigeon that was walking around in front of a Lamborghini. And I thought that that was something that was too cool to pass up. Um, so yeah, same, same thing as before, really using your environment, um, using the environment around the subject, even if it's a complete surprise, like really both of these images were, um, really just utilizing your architectural elements in the foreground and or background can be a really good way to expose and compose creatively. Um, my favorite type of daylight to photograph in is really is softer diffused sunlight. Um, a lot of the time, if you're photographing in a in a forested area during the daytime where there might be diffused light through the leaves, you might be dealing with green cast. Um, and a really good way to avoid green cast is shooting towards on on like the hour to hour and a half before golden hour um i think that it's the really it's a really good way to get evenly lit photos where there is a, your highlights are nicely exposed your shadows aren't too dark and you have and you have like a very evenly lit exposure same thing with this even if it if you don't have a forested area using using uh sporadic clouds or uh fog especially can be a really good way to get really nice diffused light um i was at this one lake in rocky mountain national park back in november uh there were a couple of moose that were feeding in the ice it was kind of cloudy and hazy at the same time and the um the sun was shining through the bottom of the clouds and going through the haze, which was diffusing the light really, really nicely to get pretty even highlights and shadows both. Moving on to the shooting styles based on location, I think that this is something that I've really started to pick up a little more um, recently. Um, I think that there's there's a lot to be said for, especially when you're editing your photos, what kind of, what what atmosphere do you want to create i think that with a lot of photography um there is there is uh the reality which is the photo that there's your camera's reality which is the raw photo um and then there's your your idea of reality what you want to create out of it so using using um your editing software to kind of create a different style based on whatever location so, for example, I was at, come on. <laughs> Uh-oh, it's frozen. Sorry. <laughs> oh, 
Ah. There we go. Um, yeah, so I was I was at I was at a ranch um doing a restoration project in October of 2023. Um, and I I did have my camera with me and I was seeing all of these very large um these very large like ranch animals, including bison, donkeys, longhorns, and and wild horses. Um, and I think that it was it was something cool to especially in camera using um, a lot of a lot of cameras now have the ability to um, shoot with different kind of like creative color profiles and picture profiles in camera, along with adjusting your white balance and other stuff like that, to be able to go for a different, um, to be able to create kind of like a, a like in this instance, an old west or like a kind of like a country, um, I guess, theme for this for this set. And yeah, so just kind of, yeah, picking a, a shooting style based on where you are can be a pretty fun challenge. Um, really, really like show showcasing these large kind of just pretty fairly dark animals in this very light, dry, barren prairie landscape was was a pretty fun challenge when I was when I was photographing all these animals. Um, another, another good thing to think about is utilizing reflections. Um, this is most easily done with water. Um, if you're photographing ducks, geese, any, any for any, any wildlife that might be, um, in or near water, I, it's a really interesting way to convey symmetry. Um, especially which, especially with birds, um, that are sitting in the water and it really can create some really interesting textures i think the the ripples and almost like duplicate like multi-duplicated image of of the subjects in the rippling water can be something really interesting to incorporate and yeah kind of going back into like natural light diffusers as i was saying before um haze is really good if it's if it's available i know that um, there are a lot of wildfires that are burning in in and around the western United States at this at this time. Um, and a lot of smoke is being blown around. So if it's a sunny day and you're able to and you're able to get out and go into the haze and go into the smoke, it can be a really cool way to to like add atmosphere into your photos. Um, something that I never really like to do is shoot midday um it's very tough to creatively shoot any wildlife when you have extremely bright highlights and extremely dark shadows um what i like to do is go out on uh if it if it ever rains or anything like that um i like to go and, and then it's immediately very sunny after it rains I'll go out and I'll utilize raindrops that have a lot of really bright sun um, shining through it to create these very interesting bokeh textures. And same thing with um, shooting birds that are sitting on water um, right in the middle of the day can be a really good way to get a lot of these, uh, a lot of the bokeh that people really like to see. Small, small in frame is a pretty, is a pretty fun um, kind of concept to work with, I think. And I think that it's become a lot more popular um, in the last couple of years. Um, it's, it's very, it's very fun if you, if you're patient enough, I think. Um, it really means that I think what a lot of people um, think and, and have thought um up until a few years ago is that in order to get like a good photo of a bird or of, of wildlife in general it means that you have to have like the sharpest frame filling portrait of the subject that you can possibly get and i think that that idea has been been broken down a little bit by people that get really creative um exposures using more of the environment and really not making the bird the center focus of the fo or the wildlife your subject the center focus but not completely filling the frame with it and i personally have really enjoyed um incorporating small and frame techniques into my 
into my photo sessions with wildlife. Same thing with this. I think um, shooting top down, especially with with wildlife that you can um, do small and frame techniques with is really fun. Um, I was photographing this Eastern newt with a lot of really interesting uh, mosses and lichens and, and rock around it. And small and frame, not getting a photo of just its eyeball with my macro lens was a really was a really fun way to show off its environment and really, really show off like how this how this animal exists in its environment. And now here is here is the close up of of its head using my macro lens. Um, but yeah, I think it, it really does just kind of prove like use incorporating small and frame really does prove that you do not have to have the closest portrait possible of your subject in order to have an interesting photo of it. Here's a couple more um, small and frame um, examples. I think really really utilizing. Um, really utilizing your your foreground and background can be um really helpful with this i think um th these were all taken from this one boardwalk at a at a peat bog in maine um they're all they're all very specialized plants pitcher plants which are very very cool um and yeah i think i think that rather than rather than showcasing stuff like the little spines on on the uh which i think i think um kind of going going off that um if you i think there's there's a lot to be said for just doing something different even if it doesn't work out completely perfect you can you can take a photo that a thousand ten thousand other people have taken um, if you, if you go super close up of, of something, but I think that if you, if you think a little outside the box, you can, you can do things that a lot of people haven't done. And yeah, this, um, a lot of small and frame can be really, really interesting and helpful at locations that have a high volume of wildlife. Um, for example, the Bosque del Apache National Wildlife Refuge in New Mexico, especially in November, there are a lot of birds there. There are tens of thousands of of cranes and, and other waterfowl that you can see on any given morning. Um, and they're not always the closest. So I think that um, utilizing utilizing the distance and the volume of the birds to get different different images, even at the same exact locations, shooting from the same spot can be can be something it can be a really fun challenge. Here's a, a couple of the challenges and rewards of of uh wildlife photography i have personally gone on many long grueling hikes and sometimes even very steep uphill bike rides just just in, on the off chance that i might find something um or i will go and i'll hop out of the car and there will be something incredible in the parking lot um so yeah i think that there's a lot to be said for this um there's a lot there's a lot of experiences to be had where you can be very rewarded by by what you're photographing even if it isn't exactly what you were expecting um something something one thing that uh is very very rewarding when when you like actually make it happen is getting a pretty decent photo of a bird in flight um especially very fast moving birds um, I can I can say that I I will have sat at um, sat with groups of feeding birds and stuff like that, just waiting, waiting for a shot. And I'll take thousands and thousands of photos, just hoping I get one. And in a lot of in, in a lot of cases, you will only get one. You'll get one photo that you're happy with. And I think that that's um, that's part of the game. And I think that that's part of the fun. Um. I personally think that the most rewarding group of birds um, to photograph for me are owls. Um, I think they're because they are not the most common birds and because um, there's just kind of this mysterious um, like aura to them. I think that it makes them really rewarding to find and photograph both. Um, but yeah, I, I do also just kind of going along that I do just want to point out 
please don't disturb the owls if you do find them. They're even though they are very rewarding to find, their their like safety and their um existence is more important than getting the photo. So I do just want to point that out. Here's a couple of here's a couple of uh, long-eared owls, which are my favorite birds. Um, a lot of the time you can use rain as a good excuse to get out and photograph owls. They'll just kind of sit there and they'll act like wet cats um, when it's raining. They their ears will go all floppy and they'll just kind of sit there and be really like upset at the fact that it's raining. Um, and you can you can use you can use that to your advantage, um, as you can see down in the bottom left. Um, but yeah, I think owls are far and away the most rewarding group of birds to photograph for me. Um, the most challenging group of birds to photograph, in my opinion, are small passerines. Um, it takes a lot of patience and it takes quite a bit of um, just kind of like luck that they don't see you and stuff like that. I've, I've actually had a couple of instances where um, sparrows like this will have been feeding on the ground and they'll be so oblivious to the fact that I'm there that they'll kind of hop into my lens hood. The, the grasshopper sparrow that you can see right here, it wasn't looking right ahead at me. It was kind of looking off to the sides for stuff. And it quite literally, this was actually the first day that I just gotten my, my new um, telephoto lens and it hopped into the lens hood. So that was that was a reward in and of itself, even though I did um, have to throw away a very muddy and ripped apart jacket um, after after that, which wasn't the best. But the photos were completely worth it. And I think um, that is definitely a sacrifice that um, I'm I'm more so willing to make than than I've seen some of my friends. But yeah, I think that that's um, the reward always, in my opinion, kind of it like outdoes the uh, the challenges that that go into photographing small birds, especially. Um, same thing with this. I think when you do have really small birds, it can be tough to um, make sure that you're focused in the right spot. I think that photographing a bird where the eye is primarily what's in focus is usually usually the the main goal um so i think that yes sometimes going small in frame with small birds can really be a good way to um effectively capture them if you cannot 100 percent ensure focus directly on the eye um i was following around this this yellow warbler one day um getting getting some trying to get some really nice up close portraits of it but i realized that um, it was moving too fast and it was a little too small for me to actually like really get focus, grab focus on the eye of. So I decided that it would be better if I just focused on the bird in general, zoomed out a little bit. Um, and yeah, just got some small and frame shots with a really nice foreground. And I think this is the, this is the last segment of this. Um, I have come to learn in the last couple of years that wildlife photography in my, like, at least for me, is the best way that I can promote conservation, ad, like, do, like, really promote conservation ideas. Um, like I mentioned before, I'm studying conservation biology now in college, and um, it, it's become a goal of mine to become a conservation photojournalist where I highlight um, more obscure species, endangered and threatened wildlife, especially in the United States, to really promote um, their preservation. Um, as I showed before with with these bogs, with these bog plants, um, they're they're quite endangered. They are not they are not doing too well in terms of um, their conservation status. Bogs are at high risk of of kind of like as an ecosystem going extinct. So utilizing your power as a photographer can be a very, very like powerful way of helping to conserve and really preserve a lot of wildlife. Um, I've had I've had people that have reached out to me um, that have kids that are really interested in in going to look for 
um things like salamanders because they they hear about something in a book or they hear about something at school and they want to go they want to go see it and i think that empowering young people especially um using using wildlife photography can be a really good way of putting putting a little more of that um the knowledge into their hands to hopefully start doing the right thing when it comes to conservation um highlighting highlighting a lot of the uh less prominent wildlife that's around the world is a really is a really good way of promoting conservation i really like to go around and photograph the the more widespread um species of of concern um such as a lot of spring ephemeral flowers in in the midwest i think that they're they're at quite high risk of um changing temperatures throughout the year the fact that um this year we didn't really have much of a winter and there's uh there have been flowers blooming back home in chicago since the middle of january um it's it's messed up and i think that highlighting that can be a really good way of um promoting promoting conservation advocacy um photographing wildlife and their like changing behavior can be a really good way um especially in areas of importance can be a really good way of promoting conservation um they're this is an american pika they're a they're a alpine tundra species and they've become quite acclimated to people um to the point that I had one try and bite my shoelaces off thinking that it was thinking that they were grasses to which it then realized it couldn't and licked the salt from the sweat that was evaporating through my friend's hiking boot off the top of his shoe. Um, it's very, it's very odd behavior. It's, it's something that, that did not used to happen. And I think documenting these, behavioral changes due to increased human activity in air in like areas of wildlife importance and stuff like that can be a really good way of promoting promoting conservation yeah and here's here's the um here's the pica though that that exact pica that was trying to to take my shoelaces off um and around it there's the um like it's it's environment it's it's very it's very pristine but there are a lot of people there there is a high volume of people that that go through this area um the photo on the left just kind of shows a small a small amount of snowpack it was i think august and at that point in time 30 years ago you wouldn't have been able to see the tundra it would have been complete snowpack um so yeah i just think really really using your power as a photographer to help promote these um like conservation advocacy is is really something that i think a lot of people uh should start thinking a little more about um and yeah when when it when it comes when it comes to endangered wildlife um when you can like using using your artistic um capabilities as a photographer can be a very good way to helping people understand a little more about conservation i think that because there are a lot of protections that are already in place, it doesn't, I think a lot of people are turned off to endangered wildlife. If it isn't megafauna in Africa, um, there's a lot of, there, there are a lot of birds. There are a lot of insects and plants that are very easily accessible as, as endangered wildlife to photograph that I think a lot of people just overlook. So, yeah, thank you. I, uh, Here's my contact information. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Looks like we do have a question in the chat that I can uh, repeat for you. Uh, let's see. Cheryl asked, do you always set ISO shutter speed and aperture for each photo? Or do you use automatic settings? I I shoot in complete manual mode. I set my ISO, shutter speed, aperture, everything. Um, I find that being in complete, I used to shoot on auto ISO just to kind of leave that up to the camera. Uh, but then I realized that I did actually like to be in complete control and and not have the camera making micro adjustments to 
to my images as I was taking them. Um, so yeah, I if that if that answers that. Awesome. And then let's see. Tina said, great ideas on using photography for conservation advocacy. I think we all appreciate you tying that in. Um, yeah, because yeah, that's our overarching goal here. Um, and then Pauline said, very nice and very clear advocacy. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, but if anyone wants to unmute themselves to ask a question, um, we'll give you guys a moment to do that. Um, I'll just say one thing. I actually, I, I got mixed up in the time zone, so I came on at one o'clock. Um, mm -hmm. But so for those who don't know me, I know my name's Gary. I work for Hunts Photo and Video. Um, I've been supporting the festival for the last three. I actually met Luke at the festival, maybe like at the San Diego Burning Festival four years ago. Um, so I met him and he and he and he, um, and he um, told me a little about the Arizona Burning Festival. So I came on board as a as a as a vendor. I've been there the last three, four years. If you ever never ever been to the Arizona Birding Festival, it's a great festival to, to go to. Um, everybody on the team does a really good job in um putting it together. Um it's 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 one it's one of I've been to probably about eight different eight or nine different festivals over the years. Um I'd probably say that Arizona is becoming one of my favorites. Um not just saying that because it's saying that to your own thing, but it's very um they do a really good job. They make you feel special, make the vendors feel special. They're out there, they're visible, uh, and they just they do do a great job making you feel part, part of the community. Um so if you're not gonna go to the, if you haven't been to the festival, give it a try. It's, it's in August. Um if you need if you're looking for any gear or need anything. Um, really what I strive on more is the personalized service, the personal touch and building those long-term working relationships. Um, so, um, please reach out to me. Um, I can, I'll have Luke maybe send my information down in an email, but, uh, we carry everything from equipment to bridge. Everything that Simon's talk about is available through hunts. Um, so you can contact me and give you um, good prices, but more importantly than all, um, personalized service, personal touch and that family owned thing that you, you don't get by online. So, um, and as far as Simon goes, I've been working with Simon. I met Simon at the Biggest Week American Birding in 2019, I think, or 18. And then we redeveloped a relationship. Well, we we, we re reconnected again through another friend of mine, Eddie Casper, who connected me to Simon. And we developed a really good relationship together. And um, he's done many programs for hunts, of course, in the last couple in the last two years. And has done has I've gotten some amazing feedback from him. Um, all the people have loved him. So um he was he did he did um he did guide a couple of years ago the Arizona Burning Festival and I'm hoping to bring him hoping to bring him back um this coming year as, as I'm hoping as, it as, works as I'm hoping it works so, out um so he's incredible knowledge type of thing and so I'm really honored to bring Simon to you um to, to this to this program hope you guys really all enjoyed it and reach out to me anytime you ever need anything but if you have any questions for me you can ask me if you have any questions for Simon you can you can you can ask us now and um thank you for everything thank you for everything yeah thank you gary for um joining and uh we'll send out a follow-up email to everyone that joined as well um and we'll definitely put contact information for simon and gary and hunt's photo um so we'll have links to those we'll also send a recording of this zoom meeting unless you um in case you'd like to share with anyone and then we can also add in information about the festival as well um so thank you gary um yeah. anyone we else? do actually have uh, real quickly i do uh, as far as other programs coming up on that we that I line up we have um two coming up with olympus um uh, two programs coming with Olympus that I know a lot of the burning people now are getting into Olympus cameras. So we got two coming up on that. Um, and then we have one coming up in July, I believe. It's going to be on shoreboard photography. Uh, I'm not shoreboard photography. Is it on the issue? No, I forget what it's going to be on. It's, um, I think I forget the topic. Not shoreboard. Shoreboard is something else. But it'll be with Alex Isengard. We'll be doing a program in July. Um, he'll be doing a program about, uh, I forget what he's talked about, but he's a really another great young photographer. Um, so he'll be coming on July and I'm working on, I'm working on lining up one or two other ones for the rest, for the rest of the year, but just why I know there's more programs come, come coming together. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We can be sure to, if you guys send me over that information, I can be sure to send that in the email as well. Um, anybody else with any questions for si either Simon or Gary?
Why don't you, why don't you, Simon, real quick, why don't you tell people, what you, I think you did it briefly, but just tell people what your current, real quickly, if they think they want to know, what's your current setup? What, 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 do you, what, I know you talk briefly, but what's your current, what do you, what do you, what do you currently have your, your lineup? Yeah, I uh I currently shoot with a Nikon Z9. Um, my main wildlife lens is the Nikon Z100 to 400 millimeter. Um, and then for anything else, I I've got a couple of wide angles, some um some primes and stuff like that. Um, I used a lot of the photo, actually quite a few of the photos from this presentation were with my old camera, the Nikon Z62. Um, I think all, all of this gear I've, I've bought directly from Gary, legitimately the best, the best customer service anyone could ask for. And, and really, really the best person that you could develop a working relationship with for camera gear. And one, one last question, maybe why don't you just, why you just ask, why don't you just, who are some of your target, who are some of your best targets that you've that you admire or that you, that you learn from? Ooh. Um, I've in, or at least in the last, in the last year or so, um, he doesn't really, he doesn't really post much anymore, but, uh, even, even to his own website, but Tobias Yoder is definitely, uh, one of, one of my biggest inspirations with wildlife photography. And then I did, and I think, um, sorry, as far as, um, I've had a, I've, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time outside with other people who are into birding and, and wildlife stuff. And I think that there's just a lot of people that take really interesting photos that um, might not even consider themselves photographers that I take inspiration from. So yeah, it's, it's the whole, the whole community as all together that really does inspire me to keep growing creatively. Cool. And then one, maybe one last question for people who are just getting started. You, I know you started with a bridge camera. So how mm -hmm. did that help you and how important if she, someone just doesn't have a budget, doesn't have a lot of money, how sure, important, sure. What, what would you talk about a bridge and how, and, what, and then how did it, how did it help you? And, and then when you made a change to, to the big camera. For sure. I, so I shot with um, Nikon bridge cameras from 2016 uh, well into 2022 and it really yeah, did really. because they because they are such um easy cameras to use that do take pretty quality images um i found that it was actually very beneficial to me to shoot on auto settings for a little while and just watch what the camera was doing while while i was taking photos in different scenarios so it was a really good way to learn what ISOs I needed to be at at certain at different times of day. It was a really good way to learn what shutter speeds I needed to be at to to get um, sharp action shots and stuff like that. So if you're if you don't currently have a camera for wildlife and you'd like to um, and you'd like to get into that, I can put my email in the chat and feel free to send me an email about um recommendations i have i've used almost i've used a lot of the wildlife like what more wildlife focused point and shoots across nikon canon lumix and sony um so i i do have a pretty good idea of what um of what is a is a good option for what you want so i'll put my email in the chat and yeah we can go from there one more question. Um, Kathy said, thanks for the info and love your photos. Do you sell any of your photos? I do. I do sell photos. If you're interested, feel free to shoot me an email. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, would anyone else like to add anything? All right. Well, I just want to say again, thank you everyone for attending. Um, thank you, Simon. Thank you, Gary. We really appreciate all the information. Um, and I just want to repeat Audubon's mission. Um, we hope to ins uh, inspire everyone to enjoy and protect birds. Um, so look out for that follow-up email and hope to see you all soon. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.
Have a good one. Thank you so much.